that this Bible for 15 years, and I just will not throw it away. Yeah. 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 There you go. Hello, Nat. How are you? Good. Good. Hey, Ben. How are you? Good. Bing bong, Avon calling. Showing my ass for say. I knew somebody would get it. Yeah. That's awesome. What's that? No, we haven't been. I have a feeling we'll have a few more straggling in. Evening, everyone. It's time to begin. Let's go to our Father in prayer and we'll get started. Our most holy and righteous Heavenly Father, how great Thou art. Hallowed be Your name. May Your will be done in our lives in all aspects. We give thanks, Father, for the privilege to come before You in prayer. We give thanks for Christ Jesus who mediates our prayer. We give thanks, Father, for the blessings that we have in Christ Jesus to be called your children and to be able to say to you, Father. We pray, Father, as your children that we bring honor to the name that we have been given through Christ Jesus, our King. We give thanks, Father, for the provisions that you have given us in the Word to direct our lives, to direct our thoughts, to change our hearts and transform us into the image of the Son himself. We give thanks, Father, for this word. We pray for the strength to love it and cherish it above all things, to seek its wisdom when we need it the most, to be able to use it against temptation when it rears its ugly head. We give thanks, Father, that we are all brethren, that we have all things in common in Christ Jesus. And as such, we pray to love each other as you have loved us. We pray, Father, that we elevate the needs of others above ourselves, that we learn to be servants, and in so doing, we can show the world a better way through Christ Jesus, our Lord. We pray for wisdom in the gospel of Jesus Christ and a trust of its power. And we pray, Father, that we share it with boldness as the Apostle Paul we're studying did. And that we don't worry about who was worthy and who wasn't, that we share its power and the power to transform in repentance and obedience all the souls that would adhere themselves to you through Christ. We give thanks, Father, for the privilege to be your servant in that power. We pray for courage and wisdom and knowledge and the ability to remember what we've learned so we can share it in accuracy. We pray for the sick who can't be here with us. We pray that you comfort them and bless them, heal them to the full extent of your power, your will be done. We pray, Father, that you're always with us as a body of Christ here, that we seek your purposes here, to be a light in the midst of a dark and perverted generation. We pray, Father, that as we learn and grow in class, we can change our lives, be prepared to alter the things that we need to alter to walk closer and better with you. And we pray, Father, for the wisdom to be able to help those we love and to be a betterment to them as well. Be with us in our class study and open our hearts and minds. And this is our prayer in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, and our King. Amen. Let's turn to Acts chapter 14. And we are in Lystra on Paul's first journey. And as we have come to Lystra, Lystra is different than the cities that we have become a little bit more uh, in common with the Apostle Paul. There's not a synagogue here. Uh, as Paul goes into the city, he's going to heal a man at the 
uh, gates of the city. Uh, this healing, this demonstration of God's power is going to bring audience. Uh, of course, the audience uh, first thinks of Paul and Barnabas as little g-gods, but uh, that brings us to the sermon portion where we entered into that last week. And the outline above me to, the, uh, to my right shoulder uh, shares that uh, Paul's going to open up the statement, no, we are not little g-gods, we are men just like you. And he would state that emphatically. Uh, he tells them that the idols that they have given themselves to are vain things, and he's uh, imploring them to turn to the one true living God. He shares that the God, uh, the, the one true living God, is the God who created all things, as we shared last week in uh, the 17th chapter, where Paul's going to repeat this sermon in a much more extensive way at the uh, Mars Hill Areopagus. Uh, he's going to share that. God is not worshipped with things made with our hands. And we went into a lot of detail, took up a lot of our time last week, speaking to the extent of our understanding of that very statement. So where we want to begin tonight um, is the final uh, point. And I want to just dwell on it shortly so that we can move on from the sermon portion and uh, finish this, the 14th chapter, Lord willing. But I want to talk a little bit about this ignorance that uh, is mentioned here in this, uh, as the 17th chapter is going to say, God's overlooking uh, a time of ignorance. So real quick before we get to the point, let's reread verses 15 through 18. Just take in the sermon and then we'll jump into this uh, final point. Verse 15 says, And saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We, are all, we also are men with the same nature as you. And preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness, and that he did good, gave us rain, uh, from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. Now, verse number uh, 16 says, Who in bygone generations uh, allowed all nations to walk in their own way. And uh, in chapter 17, um, Verse number 30 says, And these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. So this allowance of the nations to walk in their own ways, this uh, overlooking the ignorance that was before, does that mean that God uh, didn't hold men accountable? No, and, in, and quite the contrary. As a matter of fact, we learned that this ignorance was self-imposed we, we learn by the way in verse number 17 that God left witness of himself everywhere around us that all we have to do is look at nature and be able to recognize the signature of God himself uh, as witness that should cause men to want to seek him okay Romans chapter 1 Paul does a little bit better than this um, let's take just a minute let's turn over to Romans chapter 1 and let's Let's talk about the sins of the Gentiles. Now, the sins of the Gentiles are shared here, not, not that that's the point. The point that Paul's making is Gentiles have sinned, Jews sin, all men need the gospel. Okay, that's the point. But to emphasize the power of the gospel so that we would appreciate God's work on our behalf, Paul's going to share both to Gentile and to Jew how far away from God that they had gotten. So that they can appreciate the fact that God provided for them something that would bring them all the way back to him. Okay? And that's the message of the gospel preached. And once again, I'll remind you, what was commanded to be preached to every single person? The gospel. The gospel. The methodology to erase ignorance is right here. Okay? And that's why it was commanded to be preached. So, for those of us who don't comprehend our unique position as members of the body of Christ, those who have become part of the circle of Matthew chapter 28, 
uh, where we make disciples of all nations. We baptize them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. And we teach them what's the first thing that was commanded that should be taught. Make disciples of all nations. Part of the circle of our creation is that we are expected to reproduce so that the, the ignorance that exists among us is taken away. Before I read this, just one thing I'm going to share with you. Where would Apollos be? If we get to Acts chapter 18, we're going to read uh, Priscilla and Quilla are going to come across a man by the name of Apollos who was eloquent, uh, mighty in the knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures, who refuted with the Jews concerning the coming of the Messiah, yet only knew the baptism of John. Which means he knew that John said the Messiah was on his heels, but he still didn't know who the Messiah was. He was in ignorance to the specificity that Jesus was the Christ. So Priscilla and Aquila didn't jump out and say, you're going to hell. What did they do? They pulled him aside and they better educated him. They explained to him what was missing. So that the very last verse of the 18th chapter, we see now Apollos actively refuting concerning Jesus the Christ. Means he came to understand. The ignorance hole was filled. How? Through Priscilla and Aquila. Well, where, where, who educated them? The Apostle Paul in Corinth in chapter 18 in the beginning. We see them reproducing, you see. And it was no more greater work than simply educating something someone to something that was missing how many of us have friends who call themselves christian that are missing points of evidence it's not a matter of beating them with these things it's a matter of sharing the missing pieces so that the entirety of knowledge can be known that's our job and you have to be able to share it in such a way as you don't build walls where they don't listen where they can't hear it's to share it in such a way with love that you're, sh you're sharing with them the hope of the power of the gospel and its ability to save us from ourselves. Now, real quick, let's go to Romans chapter 1 and let's, let's share this self-imposed ignorance. And Paul does a really good job. Let's start in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, he's going to come back to this in chapter 6. He's going to tell us that the Wages of sin is what? Death. Death. He, he says, the wrath of God, we deserve in unrighteousness, we've earned a wage. What's the wage? Death. Death. We've earned that. We've built that in our ignorance, uh, self-imposed in our lives when we served ourselves instead of learning to serve the one true God. Okay? All of us then needed what? Salvation. We needed salvation from that. We needed to be restored back to then our creator and more importantly our purpose fear god keep his commandments is the all of man we were created with a purpose that's our purpose okay can you fear what you don't know no. can you reverence what you don't know no. can you keep the commandments of what you don't know no. sometimes the most <laughs> the most important sin that we overlook that all men are guilty of when they're on the outside is ignorance Four, six. Yeah, absolutely. You see the importance of this? He goes on. Let's go to verse 19. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. What do you need to say there? All you have to do is look at yourself to be able to see the evidence of God. How is God in each of us? Because we're made in His image. Okay, this is? Please say no. No. Okay. <laughs> Boy, yeah, if this, is, if this is our hope, we're in trouble. So, it's not what this looks like. It's the fact that we have a unique duality to ourselves. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1, remember, um, as God created everything in the, in the six days, uh, he was going to come back and share that to uh, man and woman, he breathed into their nostrils, the breath of life. He breathed into their nostrils his breath. I hope you guys appreciate that. In that essence, we not only became living beings, but we became living beings with a soul. Okay? A spirit. Used interchangeably, by the way. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 uses 
um, body, soul, and spirit. Uh, the unique thing is if you pay attention to your New Testament, not absolutely universally, but almost in every case, when it speaks about the soul, it's speaking about uh, our the existence of that spirit in us while we are still in the flesh. And when it speaks about the spirit, he's talking about what we hope to become in eternity, okay, the very nature of God. And that's the only unique difference, and it shouldn't throw you when it's used together that way. It is speaking synonymously of the same thing. However, it goes on. Verse 20 says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now that takes away this, this ignorance being uh, the fact that God's not going to judge them. No, he is going to judge them. They are without excuse because they can see God in themselves. They can see God in the creation. Uh, all these things should cause them to want to know that one true God. But he goes on and defines it even more. It says, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image like corruptible man, birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. They couldn't deny that God was there, but they said, nope, that's not good enough for us. We want to do what we want to do. They built for themselves images. They fell down and worshipped them so they could tell them what to do. And this is the self-imposed ignorance being spoken of by the Apostle Paul. He said, therefore, it's the very next verse, verse 24, therefore, because of this practice, God also gave them up. Now God, as long as they were seeking Him, could be found. Give me an example of those outside of the children of Israel who, when they sought God, God could be found. Nineveh. <clears throat> Nineveh. Nineveh. Perfect example. Uh, Jonah finally came to Nineveh after uh, trying to run from God, after stinking like a fish, uh, had to walk all the way inland to, to Nineveh, uh, gets there and demands that everybody repent, perform no miracles, and from the king to the least of them, they did what? They repented. And then he threw a temper tantrum. Okay. But he threw a temper tantrum because he didn't want them to repent. He wanted God to take them out. But think about this. What could they repent to if they didn't know God? So they knew God. What did God send them? What was Jonah as we describe him? A prophet. A mouthpiece. Name it. Okay. Okay. Uh, Naaman was the uh, general uh, for the forces of Damascus. Uh, he was a leper. The king uh, had heard from a servant that had been captured from northern Israel that there were uh, prophets in northern Israel that could heal Naaman. He sent him down with a note to the king of northern Israel and said, Hey, if you don't find the prophet that can heal my general, we're coming down and wiping all y'all out. Can you imagine the king at that moment, that was when I was a kid. That was what we called a pucker moment. He was, he was, <laughs> but anyways, they 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 sent him and they found the prophet, and of course we know the story of the dipping the three times. All of this to say is when God is found and His power is realized, He 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 shows up when He needs to be. Uh, Balaam and Balak is another one. Uh, Balaam sent for uh, Balak, uh, who was a prophet. Where? In the Ur of the Chaldees, where Abraham had come from. Now, was Abraham's family, were they worshipers of God? Wasn't uh, the, the ones that left back in Haran, didn't they, weren't they idolaters? We know they were, because remember, uh, when uh, they, Jacob left with his, all the wives he finally had to work him for, they had stolen some of the worshiping trinkets from the family. All of this to say is that the Ur of the Chaldees still had mouthpieces for God for those who still wanted to know God. Okay, All of us to say it wasn't until as a whole these people turned away. But here's the one thing, a real big thing I want you to think about. Why did God strategically put Israel where he put them? Why? 
every trade route in the known world went through there. And as every trade route in the known world went there, everybody came across who? They were supposed to come across God's unique people. They were supposed to be unique. Why? It was set apart. They were set apart. And they had been given a law different from any other nation. And their practices were different. They couldn't eat what everybody else ate. They couldn't clean themselves the way everybody else cleaned themselves. They couldn't uh, fall down and just choose to worship anything they wanted to. All of these things were given to them. An entire system of government was given to, given to them. An entire system, judicial system was given to them. Uh, an entire system of agriculture was given to them. Uh, and every seven years was the years of jubilee. They would wipe out debt and there are all kinds of things. Other nations are just never heard of such things and when they came through they would want to know why what were they supposed to be told about the one true God right why to be the answer to those who might seek to be the ones that say oh God I recognize something better than these carved things I want to know the one true God you see now fast forward to you and I Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 that we are a royal priesthood God's own special people okay we are unique in our creation in Christ Jesus okay if you go down and you read that wasn't without purpose he says that you might proclaim him who called you out of darkness we're supposed to be a light to a lost world in the same way and actually I would even say exponentially greater way than Israel ever was in our lives and the way we live and the way we conduct ourselves according to this because if in fact they are not asking us of the hope that's in us I dare say it's because they can't see the difference between us and anyone else right something to contemplate Israel suffered that many times in their history didn't they they wanted to be like the other nations they kept playing like the other nations and you couldn't tell any difference between them and the other nations during those times and God brought his judgment on them didn't he time and time again self once again self-imposed all of this to say is I just want to make sure that we emphasize we understand this ignorance I've heard this taught that well God just didn't hold them accountable to sin that's not the case at all folks as a matter of fact it is a magnifying glass on what we're capable of without him it's a magnifying glass of what we will do if allowed to be self-governing we will become so selfish in the things that we want that we will run roughshod over anything we can in life and many of us know that in our lives when we were sinners we practice such things well it's happening now absolutely absolutely that's why it's so important to share this power to talk about transformation we're not baptized into christ to stay the way we were we are meant to be uniquely different we are meant to change our image not this outer shell but the things that we choose to practice over and over and over again until we become here Paul's words are even better look at uh, look at Galatians just real quick um, chapter chapter 4 is a statement here that we, we don't pay enough attention to from time to time Paul is talking a lot here to the, the churches of Galatia concerning the difference between his time working with the brethren, teaching the power of the gospel, the transformation, versus those who want to uh, enslave them again into Judaism. Okay, verse 17 says they. They is the ones who want to enslave them in, in um, Judaism. Says they zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them. Okay, how many how many uh, people today? seek followers for their own sake yeah we, we know the answer because they're the ones wearing the Armani suits and uh, driving around in jets paid for by by poor people parishioners 
verse 18. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I am present with you, my little children for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. What's the purpose of teaching this gospel over and over and over again? What's the purpose of the repetition of the teaching? And so many things being repeated from uh, Acts all the way through Revelation time and time again concerning the consistency in Christ Jesus. It's so that Christ will be formed where? In each of us. Sanctify the Lord God where? In your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer for everyone that asks you a reason of the hope that's in you with what? Meekness and fear. Okay? Christ is formed in us. Guess who else is formed in us? God. You see? And we're sanctifying Him in the practice and the change in life. Okay. Tim, go ahead. <clears throat> I know you Bible very clearly teaches that that God God will show the truth to an honest heart. I mean, for someone that is seeking the truth, He'll provide a way. We sure. May not, we may not know. Everybody may not be the same. Uh, uh, you know, Peter was sent to Cornelius. Uh, when someone seeks to know the truth, God will provide present that opportunity to them then it's then it's up to them what they do with that but yeah this this ignorance is is something that uh, you know even the Gentiles weren't excused for I mean when 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 they you know seek and you shall find I mean it's it's taught throughout the Bible even through the Old Testament absolutely I can remember even as a young man being told over and over in my life be ready to teach the gospel. You might be an answer to someone's prayer. That's exactly what I was going to say. There's enough of us around that if somebody's seeking the truth, there's going to be a Christian that notices that, and we're instructed to teach them the truth. Yeah. And with the obligation of James 3 to make sure that the truth we're teaching is not I think, I like, I feel, or I want. It's to teach the truth, to share it out of here, to help them understand that they can comprehend this for themselves and know what God would want them to do and can do. Mary. As somebody that's been raised in um, a Christian world, it's easy to believe that truth is just what I understand from the scripture because of what I've been taught in this culture. But I believe I think it's interesting. There are a lot of great minds out there that come to find Christ because truth is evident regardless of the scripture because what happens is you see truth and then you study scripture and you see it's stating what you have learned is true in life. Therefore, you go and look at the scripture because you're like, why is this why do I have to listen to this? And that's the way the Father set it up. He set this word up to prove itself. The, the fulfilled prophecies and all of the things that he set in motion. But it is based on what men know to be true. And you see it in the way children are raised, the way children act with one another, the way parents understand their children ought to behave, the way societies understand they ought to behave. These people, regardless of Christ, will have moral goals that they know work and don't work. And that is truth. You're selfish. You run a selfish life. You hurt everybody around you. People that don't know Christ figure that out. And so when you figure out these things aren't working, and then you go and you find this law that is beautiful and points out all the things that you've kind of figured out just from life, it gives you great hope to realize there's there is a way, and and it's is based on what you've understood in life. That's that's why the Gentiles were converted, and that's why they had that code before, because men know truth. We we do. We don't know. We might not know the gospel yet. Like Tim said, he's going to bring it to us. But we understand what is right and wrong. Men have a moral code built within them. 
and they can deny it all they want to, but every man lives by it. He does not want others to hurt him. Absolutely. Well, I always have said scripture never violates our common sense. It demands that we recognize the wholesome practices that are reproducible, uh, and we, it proves it. And that's, by the way, that's, that's the determining factor of truth, is that when you apply it in every case, you have the same result. That's what makes it true, you see. Uh, two plus two is four, because that's every time you put it together, no matter what they say, that's what comes out. So it is truth, you see. Um, and in, to this end, Tim's actually right on the money. Uh, in the 17th chapter, when Paul talks about this, uh, he, he says that they should seek the Lord, uh, that they may um, grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. Uh, for in him we live and move and have our very being. Uh, a beautiful statement if you really stop and think about it, but uh, he can be found by anybody that so seeks him. But one of the dangers of ignorance is its reappearance. Uh, let me share what, what I mean. So the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about coming apostasy. And he shares it not for the sake of the apostasy, but the shake, the, for the sake of a time stamp. Because the brethren in Thessalonica were struggling with the concept of their Lord's return. And they were so worried about it, they were locking themselves in their houses, worried he was going to come Tuesday, and they weren't ready. Or that they maybe that they would do something wrong and they would, they would miss out. So Paul shares with them in the first letter and the second letter two things that all of us should take note of to be ready at any time to give an answer to the Lord. Walk worthy. <laughs> Learn from the Lord. Walk as he directs. You never have to worry. See how wonderful that is? And if you're being persecuted, put your trust in the Lord and his justice. His justice won't be met out in human standards, but his justice will ultimately be perfect, won't it? Because where will you be if you trust in the Lord? With him, and where will they be, those who persecute you? Persecute you. Chapter 1 of 2 Thessalonians says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them. Right? His justice will be perfect. But he shares the coming apostasy so they could get past Tuesday and understand that events have to happen before the coming of the Lord, his, his, his final coming. And he shares with them that uh, sons of perdition, uh, will elevate themselves to the throne of God as if they're God, and they will lead many away. But what allowed them to be led away? They did not develop a love for the truth, which meant they knew the truth, had been taught the truth, they're from among them now, but they remained in ignorance concerning the depths of the truth to protect them from such false teachers. Ephesians 4 says that we are not to... Uh, be children tossed to and fro okay, by every wind of doctrine. How do you not be children tossed to and fro? You have to mature in Christ, yes? <clears throat> Jesus taught the parable. We all know the parable of, of the wise builder who built his, his house on the rock, right? Well, Luke's account, Jesus preaches this sermon again. In Luke chapter 6, uh, verse 46, he's going to say something that you really should pay attention to. And it's, it's, it stands as a really good testimony to you and I to this very day. Verse 46, he says, And why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like the one who does what I say. He is like a man building a house. Listen to this. This is, this is added different in this sermon Versus Matthew's account. He says, who dug deep. Wasn't good enough to be on the rock itself. He dug down into the rock. Okay? Now, if, you're, if you take the first part of that statement, understand he who does what I say, what's the rock? Christ. Christ's words. And he says he dug deep into it. Is that someone who remained ignorant? No. No. He dug deep. He sank roots into it. So deep he couldn't be moved, you see, from what was obviously the truth. It didn't violate his common sense. It taught him how to live in this life in the midst of this madness and have an understanding of peace because we have a relationship with God that no one can take away. Eternity is set for us, you see. 
He dug deep. So he dug deeper than mom and dad's religion, didn't he? Yes. He dug deeper, you see, than what the TV evangelist might tell you. He dug until he was able to know the words of our Lord himself and was able to stand firm in them for himself. The storm couldn't bother him, could it? Everything that life has to throw at him went right by. When we're walking the path that leads us to our reward, we don't need to get as far as we can to the left or right real close to falling off this path because this wind of doctrine, uh, the, uh, the wind of doctrine, it makes it easier to blow us off if we're not in the center. And in the center is the truth that we're walking. The further you get away from the truth or the closer you get to untruth, the easier it is to fall off this Absolutely. path. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it happens often in pride. Happens often in self-importance, uh, self-will, all the ugly words that take away from the concept of being a true servant. I have known many, many through my lifetime uh, project preachers and project teachers who have a project, and that's become more important than the power of the gospel to save souls. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I like to add to that because it's one of my pet peeves. Uh, if we stay in the center, we need to give God the glory for that. It's not. It's not because, because of us. It. And uh, you know, pride is one of my pet peeves. I, I, I don't think there's ever any good pride. <laughs> but we use it differently today. I understand the language is different now. We're proud of our kids because they're doing good. But we need to give God the glory for the fact that they're doing good because God told us how to raise them. That's my pet peeve. So, kind of on the under the idea that you mentioned about knowing the scriptures as well as we can, and how from that springs true faith. And this is like I don't not wanting to segue, but it's a phenomenon I've noticed um, with many of my associates and people I went to at the university that um, were in uh, the Bible department. That was their major. That was their what they were studying was to be a Bible major. And it was in a, a university that's within the field of the Churches of Christ. But I can count like three, four, or five where they went through that whole program, their knowledge of Scripture exceeded my own, and, they, and their ability to cite verses and, and different attributes. And many of them no longer believe, no longer walk in faith, even though they... Um, it's almost like they they learned so much about scripture that's almost in a, they deconstructed it to an extent. And I thought about that, and I was talking with a buddy of mine. It was like we remembered this guy, we went to school with that guy, and we're like, why is it that so many of the Bible majors, as opposed to you know people in the liberal arts or even in the engineering department, why is it more of them no longer walk in faith, just as a phenomenon? So I found that kind of interesting and kind of convenient to some extent because what is the knowledge of the scriptures alone, right, without faith, uh, is not enough, clearly. Correct. But you right. can't have faith without a knowledge of the scripture. Correct. And that's, that's God's words, not mine. Right, right. Now, with that said, a couple things I want you to consider. John chapter 16, Jesus sharing the coming of the Spirit to his apostles and the work that they were going to do through the Spirit demanded that they understood that the Spirit through them was going to convict the world of sin. A knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ convicts every person. And it convicts every person differently. And I will even challenge that it convicts every person differently in every time of their life. Meaning simply that maturity is not always an issue of age. It's a willingness to change. Okay. When I was, no, I, trust me, nobody had a better education in the Word of God than I, I did. But during the, the times of my life, the self-imposed ignorance, I, I did it. I walked away from that knowledge. Okay. I knew, full, and my eyes were wide open. I knew exactly what I was doing. I chose to do that. 
I served it myself. It wasn't until I finally grew up enough to own me and realize how horrible I was in me and me alone that I knew I couldn't go any further without God. I, I came crawling back just like uh, Luke chapter 15. I did. And never looked back and I won't ever be ungrateful ever again. But it was an issue of maturity. Now, so I'll tell you to understand this. A lot of these people come to a knowledge of the scripture. Okay? But it convicts them against what they want. And the battle is between what they want and what now they've learned God really wants from them. Because initially they went into their study thinking, well, this is an easy career choice. I can make pretty good money doing this. I can live a fairly decent life and people will pay me and I can get to study the word of God. And, everything. and then they come to find out that God expected them to be a little bit different. And that shouldn't have been their focus. And they come at odds with what they learned from here, especially in the life of the Apostle Paul, versus what they had expectations of. That's why it's so important that when Paul takes Timothy in Acts chapter 16 and begins to put him through the college of real preachers, there was no college involved. It was real life. Watch me teach. Listen to my words. Watch what happens when I share the truth. And either they're convicted like Acts chapter 2, uh, they're cut to their heart, and men and brethren, what do we do? Or they're convicted like Acts chapter 7 with Stephen, and they picked up rocks and killed him. But the result was the same. Yeah, I think that's kind of where I've come is when we look at the scriptures but purely in, as an academic exercise, we miss everything. Mm -hmm. And so, Amen. And, I, and so that's why I'm kind of, that's where I've come. It's like, that's why there's that whole saying, if you want to lose your faith, go to seminary, because you, you deconstruct it, you make it, it's all academic, and it's an extent, and kind of, um, you make it less than by trying to dissect it as a human does. Sure. Right? Sure. I think Mary was first, and then I'll get you down. Well, he said it. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Dad. A lot quicker. Uh, <laughs> a wealth of money and a wealth of academia. You can put your trust in the money that you have, or you can put your trust in the knowledge that you think you have. Both of them are easy to, to draw you away from the truth. Mm -hmm. The money, money is... Uh, it helps us to survive comfortably. I understand that. But the more you have, and we can see it in the Bible, the history of the Israelites, the more money they got, the worse, uh, the worse they acted towards God. They put their faith in their rich riches in their knowledge and their riches in uh, money. They, and, and they saw the other nations around them, how well they were doing, and they wanted kings instead of the way God had a, a plan for them to have uh, prophets. And, sure. Yeah. Yeah, First Timothy 6, Timothy is told by Paul to warn brethren to our, never see godliness as a form of gain. Our abundance in money sometimes is a threat to our uh, righteousness. Yeah. And you have to guard against that. Absolutely. I was going to say, there's a huge difference in life at 18 going to college and life at 40 and life at 60 and there's a reason that, that elders have to have had believing children and do all of these things to be leaders because life at 18 is very different than reality later <laughs> just a little bit all right um last one so that we can move into next week we can move on um God gave evidence, and the evidence mentioned here to the folks at Lystra was that God created everything. They could see him in the intricacies. Um, there's, some re there's tons of really good evidences out there that are involved just in, in creation itself. Um, there are concepts that we should appreciate that, and, and we know none of us have been in parts of nature that we have to, this just did not happen by itself. Uh, and just common sense demands that we realize something greater and that's what Paul is sharing that you can't you can't be uh, thinking that you have an excuse God's all around us 
everything that we see, everything that we know, everything that we uh, contrive that is good is of him. Uh, even so much, James says that he's the father of lights. What do you wake up with every day? The sun. What's the greatest light in the sky? He's the father of it. Every single day it's a reminder that there's a God. Something to think about tomorrow morning if you were blessed with it. All right, we'll move on and move uh, into the events after the sermon. and.